Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's VC Task Force Gary's Picks event for investors and startups. My name is Joel Rosenberg, Director of Business Development and Strategy for VC Task Force. VC Task Force is an organization where the venture community comes together to address critical issues, provide workshops, and other events for the benefit of the venture and entrepreneurial communities. VC Task Force provides access to an extensive ecosystem of VCs, corporate VCs, and angel investors. You may ask questions anytime during the event, and time permitting, they will be answered live after today's interview. It is my pleasure to welcome Gary's Picks host, Gary Fowler. Gary is CEO and co-founder of GSD Venture Studios, an award-winning growth stage AI venture studio. Gary is also co-founder of the award-winning AI startup Eva.ai, as well as the investment firm DY Investments. Today, Gary will be interviewing special guest, Dr. John Enos, CEO of NeoSwap. Dr. Enos is the founder of NeoSwap, which provides a novel and socially powered solution to the NFT, liquid, I'm sorry, NFT liquidity problem. NeoSwap is a multi-party, multi-item NFT swapping framework that redistributes items in a win-win-win manner using minimal currency. By leveraging smart contracts, blockchain transparency, and block learning, NeoSwap facilitates multi-way NFT swapping at scale with off-chain pricing data to create a self-reinforcing flywheel. A PhD mathematician, John conducted his postdoctoral studies in computational neuroscience and previously founded a successful enterprise AI business. John has a passion for improving efficiency and NeoSwap represents a solution enabled by Web3 and AI to a problem. Take it away, Gary. Thanks, Joel, and great to have John here today. As Joel said, my name is Gary Fowler. I'm a serial entrepreneur investor. I've been involved in 17 startups and several unicorns. I was on the original management team at Click Software, which was recently sold to Salesforce for $1.35 billion, and also Eva.ai, which about 20 weeks ago was sold uh, to a company acquired by a company in Canada, Vizier. We believe that intellectual capacity is evenly spread around the world, but opportunities are not. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, John. So John, I have a question for you. Did you like living in Santa Barbara? Oh yeah, it was great. You know, I, I uh, <clears throat> so my goals, you know, one summer my goal was hundred straight days at the, at the beach. And so I did accomplish that goal successfully. Yeah, so I miss, I miss those days of surfing, that's for sure. Yeah, now how was it out there? Was it kind of like a dynasty and the lifestyles are rich and famous? Or, and how do you study when you're in Santa Barbara, to be honest yeah. with you? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you, you study during the day. You just make sure at four o'clock you can go surfing and then you study at night. So it's fine. I mean, those were very happy times. But, you know, Santa Barbara is a bit of a bubble. And so it was nice to get out into the real world. I've always had a desire to solve real world problems. And that's part of why I didn't go into academia. So um, at some point, it was time for me to leave Santa Barbara. Yeah, no, so you did that. So you did, this, you said 100 days of surfing? Well, yeah, 100 straight days. That was a goal one summer, yes. And I achieved it. So numerical goals with the timeline. That's a good one. That's it's, a good... it's a tough, tough life, but somebody's got to do it, right? Someone has to do it. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> so now you studied uh, your postdocs in computational neuroscience. So why did you decide? I mean, you went to Virginia Tech, you were in mathematics and philosophy. Mm -hmm. Then you got your master's degree and PhD in mathematics. Right. What made you to take the leap forward to computational neuroscience? Well, it was a one day, it's all of a sudden you said, well, I want to change everything that I'm doing. I'm sick of surfing and I don't <laughs> well, like I this. <laughs> My post I was in Santa Barbara, so I still surf. Yeah, no, it, it was, um, well, it really came down to wanting to solve problems because, you know, my PhD is in differential geometry, which is a very abstract subject and its applications are to theoretical physics. So it's really far away from real world problems. And so I was looking around to see, okay, what can I do that still allows me to use my math skills, but allows me to, you know, come closer to the real world. And there was an opportunity there to do a postdoc in uh, Dr. Gregory Ashby's lab. He was my postdoctoral mentor in the psychology department at, at UCSB. They just begun their computational neuroscience program uh, a few years previously. And he had a need to, he had all these kind of, he had a neurobiologically uh, plausible model, like this, this they had a neural network that was based on the actual biology of the brain and they needed someone to program it. And so it was a great chance for me to come in and use, you know, my knowledge of calculus and my 
coding skills to be able to program this neural network. Um, and it was fascinating because you could use the network. It, it's interesting. Nowadays, people study humans because they're trying to make neural networks better. But back then, what would happen is we wanted to understand people. So we would program the network and then we would test hypotheses. Actually, we'd observe how the network would behave and that would generate hypotheses about humans. And then we'd bring humans into the lab and see if you know the predictions were true and they usually would be. So it's quite fascinating. Um, yeah, so I spent three years doing that. I have a question for you, so because I'm also a psychologist, mm -hmm. but I know in my department and and there were some people that are a little bit different. I don't know if it was like that in your department. Okay. But there were, well, there's a saying, yeah. Say there was, uh, you know, there were some like, you know, some unique behaviors in some of the the with some of the folks without naming names. But was it like that for you too? <laughs> well, okay. First off, you remember I'm a mathematician, so I'm used to weird behavior. So there's that. But um, it, you know, there's a saying: research is me search, right? So that people are trying to figure out their own issues, and so they study them and they go into psychology. So, but I love psychology. My, my wife's a psychologist. I've always been interested in behavior, and actually, you know, the problem at NeoSwap that we're solving, in some sense, is a psychology problem, right? Because you're you have, I mean, we can talk about this, but um, it is kind of weird how my life has been moving in this direction for a long time. So you so you you went down through that and then you decided how in the world did you go to the Institute for Perception? It sounds like one of these La Jolla Gestalt kind of things. Oh, how I see. is it? Well, yeah, that's that's interesting. Actually, this gets back to the influence of my father on my life. Um, so Dr. Daniel Ennis is my father. He is a very famous um, mathematical psychologist and uh, sens actually a sensory consumer scientist. And so when I was wrapping up my postdoc, I was trying to figure out what to do next, and he had an opening in his company. And so I went, I worked for his company as a consultant. So I did that for uh, almost 10 years. It was really great mentorship. I mean, it was it, to be able to work very closely, especially when you have someone that's your father, uh, to work with him and uh, learn from him. He taught me so much, you know, about how to be productive. Uh, so that really helped me a lot. And it kind of set me up for when I started Igora. So um, yeah, that was the natural thing for me to do though. Cause I grew, I grew up kind of steeped in consumer science. Like my, my father, when we'd go out to dinner, he would always order all the desserts on the menu. And then we would have, we'd all get to taste them. We'd have to rate them. And then we'd make a little map on the table of like where people were and where the desserts were. So he was always trying to analyze everything about behavior. So it was very natural for me to go back and work for him. Uh, and it was actually a good stepping stone, you know, for me. Um, no, I got a question for you. You know, he's still your dad though. So mm -hmm. when you're working, you ever have those father, father and son times? good and bad because i know my dad i would do work with my dad <laughs> when he sometimes yeah, it was uh, real you know what i mean i don't know about you but it was like i mean no matter how smart my dad was right he would come up with some really strange curveball things and every once in a while we would hit butt heads did you have that with your dad too well yeah i mean it's true like my my dad can push my buttons because my buttons are shaped like his fingers right because as a child you know like yeah, so that's its own story, but um, I love my dad. He had a big positive influence on me. Um, push your buttons. Yeah, you can push my <laughs> buttons. He can put, there's very few people who can push my buttons. In fact, when people upset me, it's usually because they act like my dad. Like, so that's the only thing that really <laughs> gets me is. Uh, <laughs> is that because they have desserts and they throw the desserts out and say, rate the desserts? No, no, I like, I like that behavior. That's fine. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Well, no, I know. I mean, it, it can be tough, you know, with your dad. You know, you learn a lot, that's for sure. But I had the same thing when the, you would get your buttons pushed at exactly where they they uh, shouldn't be pushed, right? That would, yeah, that's right. You know, all of a sudden, you revert to a rebellious child, you know? Yeah. Okay, so you, you did that for 11 years. You worked with your dad for 11 years. So was it interesting? Oh, yeah, it was fascinating. I mean, I learned all about like sensory science is fascinating field and it's going to be very relevant with the whole metaverse, right? That so sensory science is the, the science of the sensory experience of life. Okay. In, in a lot of ways, sensory is the science is the science of the experience of life. So right now, you know, you have UX is a lot of uh, sight and sound, but taste and smell, that's what's been studied historically in sensory science a lot because it's food companies doing that research. That's just going to become more and more important. And as we kind of go into VR, getting the chemical senses, the taste and smell, and also tactile uh, senses into the virtual environments will be very important. So that was a fascinating field. I learned a lot. And uh, consumer science, you know, the science of consumer behavior, which is pretty related to behavioral psychology. 
um, also a fascinating field. So um, yeah, I mean, it was great training for what I'm doing now. And then um, it set me up to start my own company, Igora, which I did after I, I left IFP. Wow, that's amazing. So, you know, it's going to be interesting, though. You talk about perception and sensory senses, but when we start talking about things like a neural link and where you can start pushing those parts of the brain that actually elicit those kind of responses, is it real or not? You know, you talk about the virtual world, right. you know, the blended world. When is it going to be real or not? It's going to be really, really interesting to see what happens, you know, as we move forward. And mm -hmm the world's going to be and do you really i remember you know a long long time ago we talked about what's real and what's not so at some point in time it's going to be so blended you won't know what is physically real or not and it, maybe it's all real right mm -hmm. yeah that gets us down into the simulation hypothesis right the new the new religion in silicon valley the god's a computer programmer so um exactly yeah. exactly i mean do you think what do you think about that you're well, a mathematician. yeah oh well i don't believe it for the same reason that I don't really believe in God, because it's the same argument. Okay, we're going to get totally off topic here. But if you believe that, that this world is a simulation, suppose you accept the simulation hypothesis, and you think this world is a simulation, all right? Well, that, that it's there's some higher world, there's some upper world, right? The same argument applies there. And that's going to be a simulation too. And so it's going to have to be simulations all the way up. That's kind of yeah, so where, where, where's from. Yeah, where's the simulation start? Yeah, exactly. And then what's the chance that we're the bottom layer in this giant stack of simulations? I don't really believe it, but that's another topic for. Um, another no, I day. love that. We can do that sometime. I like that really. You know, I have a friend of mine. I got, you know, off topic for a second, but I have a friend of mine that's a NASA astronaut, a Christopher mm -hmm. Altman. Tell me there's six billion white planets in the Milky Way galaxy, an estimated 2.2 trillion galaxies in the universe. And we started to talk about what the probability of life is, you know, mm -hmm. in an Earth like planet the Goldilocks zone and I started to think about it really high really really high when you start to look at the that situation mm -hmm. so tell me a little bit Igora so what what exactly what were you doing with Igora and you got that started now you're a senior advisor what's that all about yeah so I, Igora is a company it's kind of adjacent to Institute for Perception but Institute for Perception is a consulting company right and so they would oversee projects they would do they're really external uh, supplier what I realized was there was a need to help increase the skill inside large corporations. You know, all these in a big CPG companies, uh, and I don't want to name names just for confidentiality, but you have lots, every big CPG company, just companies, you know, such as Procter & Gamble or whatever, all these companies are trying to use AI. And it's just a challenge. You know, how do you use AI when you've got really idiosyncratic data, like the market research data, where there, you don't have, you have a lot of it, but it's really diverse and the studies are fairly small. So there are a lot of challenges that have to be met if you're trying to use AI in that world. Um, and I thought there was a need to increase the internal capability of these companies. So that was the mission of Igora, that we help sensory and consumer science teams implement artificial intelligence. Uh, and that was you know, very successful at Guru. I think they've got, they've got something like 15 people now. They're still running. I mean, it's a healthy company. Um, I just stepped back from it to do Neospop. So um, yeah, I think for them, they, they have to work on data. Well, yeah. So tell me about how was a consumer products company? What would they use it for? What kind mm -hmm. of application? Well, a lot for product development, right? Where you've got, um, there's all sorts of, well, for one thing, they're wanting to monitor consumer behavior all the time. And they're, the product development life cycle is fairly long, where you have an idea for a product, but it can be, it can be six months, it could be a year before a product finally gets created once the idea comes along. And so there's a big need to move faster. So then the question is, what can you do with your current data? How can you use machine learning models along the way to avoid having to go backwards in the product development uh, path? Okay. Normally, what happens is you have some product, you have some prototypes, you make analytic measurements. Hopefully, they hit the targets. If they don't, you have to make more. Okay. Then finally, you go to the next stage. You do sensory measurements, and there's like all these stages. And every time you have to go back, you lose like six weeks. And so with AI, you can greatly reduce the chance that you have to go back a step. Because you can make predictions at you know at every stage that you would make a decision, you can make predictions one step earlier. So then that can save a lot of time. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's very valuable to use use your data and to make be using predictive modeling. Are the data sets big enough, John? I know there's synthetic data, right? But are the data sets really big enough to be able to make those kind of decisions today? Like really, you know? Because well, yeah, I mean that, that's the top, right? The data sets yeah. are not wide enough 
and you know they think they are but they're not and then you got synthetic data and there's there's ways but where are we with that process yeah i would say that most large companies are not using neural networks for the most part they're using a lot of tree-based methods um you've got you, you there are other machines everyone's attached with neural networks but they're not always the right architecture so if you've got like small diverse data sets you can do better with um especially random forest gradient boosted trees this kind of thing um yeah, and then there's a lot of work to get the data together because ideally what you'd like, get the data organized and uh, get it labeled and categorized in such a way that you could use a neural network or you could use some of the more powerful machine learning tools. But um, yeah, well, so anyway. We're, there, get, we're able to forecast behavior out in time because we have so much that you can do a year and a half, you're gonna know what the trends are gonna be, and what products you should have. When do you think that's gonna happen? So let's, you know, we, we look at it and then you have cultural sensitivities, right? So we have a bias, uh, you know, uh, being in the U.S., but what about forecasting in Brazil? So mm -hmm. when do we, we're going to be able to have the right product, the right place at the right time, all the way down to, and it's just interesting for me, all the way down to the point that you forecast that behavior to the point you can actually make the product, right? It's like a closed loop system. And mm -hmm. that would be really interesting for computer com consumer products companies. Mm -hmm. So- are we at that level? I mean, are they thinking about that? Well, a few years in the future, is a, that's a tall order, I would say. But uh, a few months into the future, and then you speed things up, you know, I think that that is starting to happen. Um, you know, the, there's all sorts of data sources, you know, that people are drawing from. And there's a big question, what are the data sources that are most informative, early signals, this kind of thing? A lot of research in that, that area, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so let's go down to NeoSwap. So how in the world did you come up with uh, the idea of NeoSwap? And oh, by the way, why did you go from Santa Barbara to Virginia? Oh, okay. Well, I just, I just moved to Virginia to work with the Institute for Perception. So. Oh, okay. Because I was going to yeah. go. It's like, oh, my God, you're out there surfing 100 days in a row. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's right. But you know, the cost of living in Santa Barbara is very high. So I have a nice house on a nice, you know, in a nice neighborhood for less than my portion of the rent was in Santa Barbara. So I actually am pretty happy with my um, my move. But anyway, to, to go with NeoSwap, that's an idea that actually comes originally in some sense from my father. Um, my father was interested in the question. It just He just got, for some day, he, he just thought, all right, what happens at Christmas if I give out the Christmas presents at random to the kids and then they trade them with each other? Will, will they, will the presents end up where they're supposed to be? That was a kind of, I don't know, behavioral science question he was interested in. So- yeah, but, uh, yeah. You have to assume, right, that you're giving them the right press. <laughs> so, right. Well, that, that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point. Um, maybe you end up getting a bow and arrow. You know what I mean? It's like, how does it go down through? I, I mean, so I, I put my psychologist hat on. When I have some fun, let's get presents that you know they don't want, and let's see what really happens, right? right. How does that work? Right, right. That, those are good experiments. Yeah, well, we can run them with NFTs and Neospot. That would be interesting. You know what? I, Maybe there's some academic researchers that like to look into that. Um, I mean, yeah. this would be really interesting. And then how do you tier the presence so that the person, you know, you understand what they, uh, the, that they may not want it, but they're willing to accept it. Yeah, well, that that's right. And these are, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a big world of kind of behavioral economics in our future at NeoSwap as we work out a lot of, um, yeah. But, um, but just so that people understand. So Gary, if I change my background and put a NeoSwap trade up here, will people see it? Is that going to? It'll yeah, work. Yeah, sure. Let me, let me try this. Okay, so I'm going to try to change my background. Okay. I mean, go down through it so they understand. Okay, so this will help people understand. So this is a 20-person trade that happened on our platform. The whole point of NeoSwap is that people come together with, with illiquid items. In this case, you have NFT art, but there's lots of applications to NFTs, and we can talk about that. Um, but they come together, and in an event, which we call a party, we very quickly find that this 20-person trade is good for everyone. Okay? So this is... Yeah, and notice this is not barter because we've got money. 20 percent trade or 20 percent? No, 20 person. There are 20 people in this. Okay, trade. so it's good for everybody. Now, why is it good for everybody, Doug? Yeah. So the, the idea is that from everyone's perspective, they prefer whatever they're getting to whatever they're giving up. Okay. And we, we have lots of ways to try to figure out how much the people value the items. It's a little bit like my, um, you know, myself and my siblings at Christmas. So back then, what would happen is, my parents would go shopping, they'd buy the presents for all the kids, they'd wrap them up and they put them in the big box labeled surprise, okay? And Christmas day, we'd pick presents at random and then we would have to trade them with each other, okay? So what was going on there was that inside us, each of us, you know, you can think there's like a utility metric. There's how much we each value every item. And what we're looking for, a good trade is when people 
assign more utility to what they receive to whatever they surrendered, right? And in that chart that you just saw, the trade that was found had the property that everybody was getting more utility from the stuff they were getting than whatever utility they assigned to what they were giving up. Okay, so it's mutually beneficial trade. That's what we're. That's what. Well, we're what looking. happens? I don't. I don't know. Do you, do you have brothers or sisters, John? I have one brother and two sisters. Okay, so let's say your brother wants the same thing you want, mm -hmm. exactly the same thing, and so you have one of them. Right now, what happens in that situation where do you both equally want that product? Yeah, the situation that would be an interesting swap, right? What happens when you value it the same way? Yeah, probably the trade just wouldn't happen. Is what it because in our system actually the people getting things have to value them more than the people giving them I, up. Yeah, so so there the, nothing would move. Yeah, we're looking for things that are good. Um, and, and actually, Either go that or you get to be a really good salesperson and you convince them that like, oh. you're proud. You know what I mean? There's another yeah. element, right? It's like, how does that work in terms of adding that, not just the pure swap, but then when you actually have some salesmanship inside of that swap to be able to convince them to do something, value some, another product more. I mean, does that come into play? The well, behavior, that yeah. part of this whole aspect. Well, that's a good question. Yeah, because like I mentioned, we have parties. And one of the big surprises for us, like, you know, the thing is, we in, in the long run, what you really want is you have a giant network, you have items that are basically at each node, there are some items, the blockchain records the ownership, okay, you got a utility matrix somewhere that tells you how much everybody values things, and you're going to move things around, okay. If you magically knew all the utilities, you wouldn't need the parties, you would just be able to move things around. But you've got this okay. kind of that for our, the, our audience, the the utility part. Yeah. Okay. Suppose that you are just God, and you know. I know I said I don't believe in God, but imagine there's a God, and God can look down into everyone's hearts and see how much everybody values every item in the world. Okay. Well, what God could do is God could say, "Well, you know what, Gary? Um, you know, you got the piano, but I know that you do. Well, maybe you like your piano, but imagine you don't ever play the piano, but you really like the accordion, and I just know that." then I might propose a trade where you give up your piano and you get an accordion. And maybe the, your piano goes to one person and somebody else gives you the accordion and there's some complex set of exchanges. What would happen is everybody gets things that they like better than whatever they gave up, okay? And I was kind of making the point in this trade that it's, um, we have money moving around too, okay? That's why a lot, a lot of times people think this is just barter, what we're doing, but it's not. It's the evolution of currency because currency is an indirect solution to the problem of mismatched wants, that people want things differently. And so you have currency help solve that problem, okay? But here, we now we have a direct solution. For the first time in human history, we can now, with really thanks to blockchain, we can talk about this, with blockchain and AI together. Currency helps solve it or currency creates a problem too, right? Well, currency creates a lot of problems. So we, <laughs> we yes, we can talk about that too. But, uh, but here, what we've got is we're able to equalize the value using currency. And that makes many more trades possible. Okay, so we kind of perfectly balance the trade. So this trade is just as good as it for everybody. Like this trade is equally good for everyone because when there's a value mismatch, you can make it up in currency. Okay. Got it. So you got, and, and notice it's peer to peer now. It's like mismatch, you can make it up for it in currency. There can be uh, a trade, but then there's going to be currency attached to that trade, right? Right, right. So, like, suppose we have a trade that's really good for you and it's not so good for me. Well, we can basically adjust it so that it's just as good for both of us by having it be that you get a little bit less currency and I get a little bit more and it equalizes the trade. So currency helps fill in gaps in value. And then that makes a lot more trades possible. Um, it turns out. So this is way, way better than, this is not barter. It's evolution of currency. That's um, in fact, you, know, you trade, right? Cause you go back to your, um, the example with your brother, your brother gets something that you really wanted and you come up with some cash and say, listen, uh, I really wanted it. Here's 10 bucks more you know, um, what, let's do a deal. He may be willing yeah. to give up something else and you're able to take that. That I understand. That's great, actually. Yeah. So that's, what, and notice there's no, like what we're used to in a kind of web two world is a central market mechanism where mm -hmm. normally what happens if people want something, they have to sell their stuff. So it goes to some central market, they get money, which means there have to be buyers somewhere. There has to be a liquidity provider. Okay. They get money. Now, hopefully from that same market, they're going to be able to go get the things they want. Okay. So there's almost always some central market. In fact, you have giant two-sided marketplaces all over Web2. That's like the nature of Web2 is the two-sided marketplace. This is an all-sided marketplace where everyone is a buyer and a seller, and there's no central market anymore. We're able to do the direct peer, thanks really to smart contracts, 
we can execute these direct peer-to-peer -peer transfers in a, in a complex way. So notice mm -hmm. that there's people who are giving, like at the very bottom, there's Atlas, okay? He's getting an NFT. He's giving money to somebody else, all right? And so that all, this only works because it works for everyone all at the same time. So this is something that's really uh, new. And um, without smart contracts, it's very hard to execute. You would need, yeah, we can talk about, it. you can do something like this in web two, but it's much harder. So web three is really the natural place to do this. All right, super. So listen, we're coming up to the top of the hour. So your closing thoughts, and I want to make sure people were able to get a hold of you. So hmm. um, looking for investment or looking for partners, you know, what are you looking for? And uh, as part of the summary and uh, how can they help? Yeah. Okay. Well, we are, um, we're live on the Stacks blockchain and we pretty much have kind of hit the ceiling in terms of Stacks is not very big. We're pretty much doing as much volume as, I mean, we're at the limit on Stacks. So we're expanding to Solana. Okay. So we'll be live on Solana. Um, we beta testing. We're beta, actually beta testing now. We're going to do a soft rollout in the middle of October. We have a new UX that's coming. And so our kind of big launch will be in the new year. Uh, in terms of what we're looking for, uh, we have a little bit left, about 250000 in our pre-seed that we would still take investors to extend our runway because we'd like to hold off on opening the seed round until, until we're live on Ethereum. So we're going to scale up on Solana. We're going to find the correct use cases because we do lots of experiments on Solana. And then at some point next year, we'll launch on Ethereum. And ideally, we would wait until we're live on Ethereum to open the seed round. So um, yeah, we've raised just over a million so far. Um, we have some more money coming in. So our goal is kind of 1.5 for the pre-seed. Got it. And what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? The LinkedIn, uh, email, what's the best way? Signal? Um, well, LinkedIn would work fine. I'm also, I'm on Telegram, which is John Ennis, no space, John Ennis. Or they can email me, john.ennis at neoswap.ai. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks for taking time here to busy, busy schedule. Oh, thank you, Gary. And for the audience out there, thank you very much for joining one more time of VC Task Force and Gary's Picks. I'm your host, Joel. Closing yes. thoughts. Thanks, thanks. thanks to uh, both of you guys. Uh, John, really interesting what you're doing there. By the way, uh, I also was, uh, Santa Barbara is also my alma mater in CSP. Oh. And, oh, great. Uh, I, I had two sayings for Santa Barbara. One was, uh, it was a town for newlyweds and nearly deads. Uh, <laughs> I've heard that, yeah. Yeah. And the other one is Santa, UCSB would be a great place to go to school if you didn't have to go to school. So, uh, <laughs> I, I you know, fully, yeah. Yeah, yeah, fully share your sentiments there. So, yeah. anyway, uh, thanks again, everybody. Um, we'll see you back here in two weeks on the 28th uh, for the next edition of Gary's Picks. Until then, everybody stay well and take care. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody.